Here to discuss why he thinks Joe Biden is wrong about that is Stephen Wertheim, Deputy Director of Research and Policy at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and author of the new book, Tomorrow the World, The Birth of U.S. Global Supremacy. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. We're hearing lots of positive stuff about the return of diplomacy, multilateralism, the UN, NATO, but your thesis is that that's where it all went wrong 80 years ago. That was all just a front for US global military domination, an excuse to be the world's policeman and deploy troops to more than 170 countries today. Am I correct in saying that's your thesis? More or less. It was part and parcel of the way that US armed dominance was executed and legitimated. And my concern as I look at the early signs from the uh, new Biden team is that they clearly want to go uh, away from the America first of Donald Trump. Uh, that's, that's obvious. But what I'm looking for is a recognition that American foreign policy has been fundamentally off course for many decades even in the absence of totalitarian conquerors. Three decades ago, when the Soviet Union collapsed, yeah. the United States set out to dominate the world by force and has made that its overriding priority. And just layering other initiatives, uh, politeness, diplomacy, a concern for human rights, on top of that fundamental objective, I don't think is going to deliver the kind of change that we need. You mentioned the collapse of the Cold War and how that impacted, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, how that impacted on U.S. foreign policy. Your argument in the book is that the U.S. used the threat of totalitarians abroad like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union to justify its military primacy, the argument being, in your words, better us than them. Uh, but in recent years, people have tired of war because Al-Qaeda or Saddam Hussein clearly uh, aren't on the level of a Stalin or a Hitler. But how about China? Both Republicans and Democrats see China as a rising threat, a genuine adversary, don't they? So China is a, a very serious challenge. And to that extent, the new focus on China uh, by this town behind me, Washington, D.C., is rational. But I would make a real distinction between the kinds of challenges China has thrown up mainly they're economic. They have to do with climate change, right? China is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, pandemic diseases. That's an obvious one. What we have not seen from China, but what we saw from the Axis powers and Soviet-backed communism, is an agenda bent on armed dominance, on conquering others, not many people believe that U.S. partners and allies, even in China's own region, like South Korea, Japan, the Philippines, are in much danger of being attacked by China today. So the United States has an opportunity, yeah. an opportunity to pull back with its military to actually obtain what the American people need on the real threats that they face where they live and work, pandemic disease climate change. We need to cooperate with yeah. China and, to an extent, co compete with China. But we shouldn't be making this a military first contest. I mean, in some senses, what you're saying is so obvious, you know, especially with the coronavirus pandemic killing Americans in their thousands every day. You're having a 9-11 uh, every two or three days right now. Um, and yet, isn't part of the problem, Stephen, that a lot of U.S. foreign policy and even military action happens below the radar. Many Americans would struggle to find Niger on a map, but U.S. Special Forces have been killed there on Donald Trump's watch. Uh, we're basically at war in Somalia in just the first few months of this year. In fact, the U.S. conducted at least 39 airstrikes in Somalia, and we don't talk about it in Congress. We don't talk about it here in the media either. Well, I'm glad you're talking about it. But look, these wars actually do catch up with us. I don't think it would have been possible for an out, a political outsider like Donald Trump to ascend to the presidency without uh, 15 years behind him of forever war in which Americans were constantly told by members of both political parties that we had existential enemies and we had to uh, go to war to defeat them, existential enemies all around the globe. That has become corrosive to our own democracy. 
So I'm, I'm absolutely with the president-elect when he says he wants to strengthen our democracy and even find places of agreement uh, on issues where yeah. Democrats and Republicans might be able to, to work together. And you know what? About three quarters of Americans say they want the forever war to end. They want uh, American troops to fully come home from Afghanistan and Iraq. That is something that I would like the Biden administration, among many other things, to deliver on. And it will actually be a source of national unity in the United States. I mean, the problem is, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, you know, for ordinary people, quote unquote, the masses, foreign policy uh, has never been a kind of top priority. It doesn't feature in polls as the issue they care about or vote on. So, yes, 75 percent may say we want the forever wars to end, but it's not topmost in their minds. They're thinking about health care. They're thinking about how to survive the pandemic, how to get a job, etc. Uh, and that's part of the problem uh, because it, it isn't the focus of our conversations. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the economy. Let me ask you this. You write in the book, America has, quote, no widely shared, deeply felt purpose for vast global power. But doesn't that ignore the role of the economy? You mentioned earlier that U.S. foreign policy is off course, and yet some might argue, no, it's on course. There are significant economic interests that drive our involvement in the world. There's a very simple reason, for example, why the U.S. is so close to Saudi, close to Saudi Arabia, and it has little to do with our values. It has all to do with oil and arms sales. So don't we need to be honest about the fact that if we're going to have any chance in, of changing our discourse when it comes to foreign policy, acknowledge the economic role, the self-interest? There's no doubt about it. And in fact, it's precisely the paucity of strategic rationale for American global military dominance after the collapse of the Soviet Union for three decades now, right? Uh, that exposes the fact that what has been driving American foreign policy has not been sound strategy. It's been other concentrated interests, uh, just as you say, that drive U.S. policy in particular ways. That said, the United States, for most of its history, was not out to dominate the world by force. The United States made a choice to go in a different direction, and now we have concentrated interests standing in the way. But this is changeable, and I do think that the American people on the left and the right understand that what the United States is doing, spending half of our federal discretionary budget year after year on the Pentagon, just does not speak to the interests yeah. of the American people where it's, they live and work. And it's not even sound foreign policy. I mean, half of the discretionary budget on the Pentagon, when you put it like that, it's just nuts. I don't think any American uh, would agree with that if it's put to them in those terms, but it often isn't. You said this stuff is changeable. We had former Obama State Department official Ambassador Wendy Sherman uh, on the show earlier this week calling Biden's foreign affairs team, she praised them as seasoned veterans. Others would say they're just products of the blob, quote unquote, the D.C. foreign policy establishment. How much new thinking, Stephen, do we think we're going to get on global affairs from people who did similar jobs under Barack Obama and Bill Clinton? Aren't we in urgent need of new thinking, new people? We absolutely are. Um, you know, it, it, it boggles the mind why, why uh, every appointment has to be from... Uh, somebody who had a role in recent policymaking, which has caused a lot of dissatisfaction in our country. Uh, so we'll see, you know, who else Biden assembles around him. I'll say this, though. I do think that a lot of it's been a long four years, many, and even coming out of the Obama administration, oh, yes. especially some of the younger, some of the younger foreign policy hands were coming to bolder conclusions than their elders. So I think yes. there are a lot of opportunities Agreed. for the Biden administration to go in the right direction if they want to and if they want to respond to where their party truly is. Although the elders are in charge right now, Stephen. That's uh, one of the issues. Let me ask you this. One last question. What are the chances of progressives who want an end to endless wars, a cut in the Pentagon budget that we discussed, a cut in support for dictators, U.S. support for dictators? What is the chance they have of influencing Biden's foreign policies to a similar or to the same extent that they clearly have his domestic agenda? So far, there's been a disparity. 
you know, there was not a task force on foreign policy between the Sanders campaigns and the Biden's campaigns, as there were on a range of domestic issues. So this is a big concern. And perhaps the Democratic Party is most divided right now on the issue of foreign policy rather than on any piece of domestic policy. But I am optimistic, I think, <laughs> relative to what happened under Obama. You know, the, the left of the party was really quiescent under Barack Obama on foreign policy issues, even as the war in Afghanistan expanded yes. before it contracted, the use of drones vastly expanded. I think that Biden is a different kind of figure. No one's under any illusions about who Joe Biden is, fundamentally. A and so I think yeah. it's vitally important for okay. progressives to keep up the pressure as we go forward. I hope you're right. The book is Tomorrow the World. Stephen Wertheim, thank you so much for your time and for your insights.